Christian Howes, how are you doing? Great, Dr. Wallace. Great to see you. It's good to see you too, man. Um, how is, uh, how's your family? We're good. Um, my, uh, my 10 year old son is here and we're doing the homeschooling thing. And my oldest child, Camille is graduating from Oberlin after a five year, uh, double degree. Uh, I'm really proud of Cammy because, uh, Cammy is going to be the first, uh, violin player to graduate with a degree from the jazz department at Oberlin. So it's a super proud moment. And, uh, not just because of the jazz thing, but <laughs> just proud of Cammy for, and it's a big milestone in our family's life. Of course, it's, you know, the, the COVID thing is kind of puts a damper on that for, for, for Camille. And, uh, but I would say that for, for me here at home, I'm, I'm happy to be home. I'm usually on the road a lot and just speaking selfishly, I'm happy to be home. So. Yeah. I was talking to Rodney Whitaker and he was talking about how, um, you know, he, he realized how exhausted he was when, uh, when this thing hit and, uh, and has, um, been able to use it as a way to reconnect with family and, and, and gets in rest. Yeah. So, so that's a, that definitely a positive thing. Um, you know, I'm, the, I'm, I'm in the same boat there. It's, it's hard to, like you, you get used to grinding and just doing all the stuff that you're doing and, you know, not relenting and just keeping it going. And, you know, cause so much of what it is that we do depends on momentum. Yeah. And so, you know, you have, you have to keep it moving. You got to keep it moving. Um, and, uh, so, you know, I, I don't think very much about being tired or, you know, Unless I'm forced to, which I've, I've, I've been forced to. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so I was trying to think back of, as, uh, as to how we met. Um, it's a little cloudy. I, I will say though, that before, even before I met you, even when I was still living in Michigan, uh, so prior to 2004, um, I knew who you were and had actually been listening to one of your recordings. Wow. Uh, I think it was one of the Yamaha recordings. And I think Bobby, Bobby Floyd was playing keyboard on that. Yeah. And, uh, and I just, uh, I listened to that, that, that CD quite a bit actually. Wow. And, and my dad really was a fan and he actually is the one that turned me on to it. Wow. Um, so th I don't think we ever had that conversation and actually yeah. talked, talked through that. But when I was thinking about our, our, uh, interview, our time together, it just, it made that dawn on me. I was like, wait a minute. You know what? I was like checking this cat out. Like before, before <laughs> I, I, I had no idea. That's so yeah. cool. Um, now I'm trying to think of after I moved to Columbus, we had well, lunch at Panera. Okay. That's, that sounds, yes, that's right. That's yeah. Or coffee or something, you know, we had yeah, coffee yeah, yeah. over in, by in New Albany or something like that. In that's that, right. That's right. And, uh, uh, let's see, what else was it? So, so when did we first play together though? That's, that's the thing I'm, I'm not sure about that. If there was like a jet, there was like a jam session, maybe like with Bobby there, we, we ran into each other. Maybe I, I might be making that up. Or if it was like something with jazz arts group, or if it was like that, I just maybe heard you somewhere and maybe you heard me somewhere. Like you might've stopped out at Dick's Den one time and, or right, I might've right. seen you play with your band somewhere, you know, or something like that. You know, you're, you're speaking of jazz arts group. Um, so we definitely, we definitely did that. And that, that's been uh, documented. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's been documented. That was a great. That was a great. I had a great time uh, playing with you that way. We, uh, what, what was the tune? Caravan. We got to go back and back and forth a little bit on Caravan. That was pretty, pretty cool. Um, I feel like we did two together, two tunes together, but maybe not. Maybe I'm making that up. But no, I think we played a couple tunes together. I think we played like 
four tunes total or something. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And then, uh, we went down to, uh, Gen. Was it? It was, yeah, the Gen conference, which Louisville. was in, that's right. It was in Louisville that year. And, uh, and we did the same thing again. That was, that was pretty cool. I felt like I, I, I felt like I blew it there on that one. I felt like when we played in Columbus, that it was really like, I felt really good about everything. And then there was one moment when we played at Jen at the very end where I felt like I blew it. Cause it's like, we had this thing at the very end where we were supposed to kind of trade, but it was just like open. It was like, nobody said what was going to happen. It was just like, yeah, Sean and Chris are going to do something, you know, here. And it was this kind of open cadenza moment. And I felt like I dropped the ball, man. So I, I've always wanted oh. to tell you that I'm sorry. I, I let you down at that moment there. <laughs> No, this is this is this is foolishness. No, it was it was great. It was great, man. It's always great. You you always sound so great. And um you know, one thing about playing an instrument that is not a common instrument. It seems to me that that's going to make you have to really hustle. And um I can't think of somebody that is a harder grinder and hustler than you. I mean, that's you... funny. I was going to say the same thing about you, Doctor Wall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, and it, it, I, I guess it'd be interesting to see how we're different in our. Because I think of you as one of your many, many Renaissance man strengths is your affinity or your study and implementation of productivity hacks and you know and i even had hired you to you know to to lecture about productivity you know at my uh, summer camp and and uh and i know you've had other videos that you've done i think on your channel where you've talked about productivity and how you do so many things and so i think it, it's it's just interesting to me that i feel like we're both really driven but i'm guessing that we have slightly different ways that we think about it or that we do it you know i'm certainly not organized like you i don't even know how to do a spreadsheet man <laughs> <laughs> and you've got like four dimensional spreadsheets you use <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i really have just a couple simple things that i try to do uh one of them is i try to get everything on a calendar um so if if um if something is going to be real then it has to occupy a space. So I just, I try to get something on the calendar and, and then maybe two of three things I do. The second thing is I have a list of things, a running list of things so that when I get to one of those scheduled times, I don't have to think about, I don't have to like think about what it is that I'm going to do and kind of like get uninspired because I'm like, using all my creative energy trying to remember what I was going to do, you know. And and then the third thing is, as much as I can, um, I try to do what I say. And to the extent that I don't follow through with certain things, I try to make adjustments um, uh, to to help me to be able to do what it is that I'm saying. Because it doesn't, it doesn't help. Writing stuff down is not helpful. If you're not going to do what you say, you know, um, but that's, I mean, that's, it's, it's actually pretty simple and I, I, I am sort of stuck with this because <laughs> I'm stuck with this because I realized that if I didn't get something together, um, and you know, be consistent that there was going to be a huge list of things that I was never going to be able to do that are like constantly rummaging around my mind. It was just going to drive me crazy, honestly. It's this. This is actually my coping mechanism to <laughs> <laughs> stave off, you know, uh, you know, just, just you know, it, it's it's for mental health. You know, people talk about taking a mental health day. You know, the, my schedule is is to preserve mental health. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Um. But you know, uh, can you can you talk to us about how you grew up and uh, what about the violin drew you in? Uh, maybe can you talk about some early teachers and um, mentor figures? Sure. Yeah, I mean, 
I started when I was five in Suzuki. So my folks who actually both went to Ohio State, they were vocal majors, then they dropped out because I was born when they were like, you know, 20. Um, but um, they kind of made a promise. They said, we're going to enroll our son in, in, in violin when he turns five because they had seen these Suzuki kids showing what they do. And for anybody who doesn't know, Suzuki is just a method for teaching really young kids about the violin. And it's based on this kind of, I think they call it like the mother tongue approach, which is the idea that, you know, between the age of two and six, our, you know, our brains are programmed to absorb language. And that's why, if, you know, if a kid grows up in a, a bilingual household, you know, it's, it's easy for kids to learn language. And the idea is music is like language. And so we learn music by ear from hearing from hearing it, especially when we're young, we do that faster. And so Suzuki is just a method for the violin that, that's based a lot on the ear. And, and it's also really based on the idea that the parents are, or at least one parent is very, very involved. And, you know, the kid's supposed to practice every day. Mom's supposed to sit there and help. And then, and then there's a teacher and it's put the parent teacher triangle. So not to give a huge lecture about Suzuki, but, I, but I feel like one of the things I love about Suzuki is, I mean, a lot of people can have, their conception about what Suzuki is or it isn't, but I feel like it's actually a broader community and things that make it great, in my opinion, are the focus on using music as a way to develop uh, good citizens or good people, you know, to grow children into being good people. And uh, of course, I didn't understand that when I was young, but um, <clears throat> but anyway, that you know, so I got it. I got the benefit of that that nurturing from my mom and from my teacher Jenny Christofferson, who started the program in 1976 in in Bexley there, and she's still there. She's like a hero to me, you know. She stays in touch, and uh, but Emmanuel Ack says that. Uh, I think I heard him say one time, he's a great classical piano player. And I heard him at a, at a master class with Yo-Yo Ma one time. He said something like, you know, kids start music because their parents tell them to, <laughs> or, or they start music, to, you know, to please their parents and please their teachers. And we hope that later on they fall in love with it. And I feel like that, that resonates for me. I mean, when I was eight, I remember my, I didn't want to practice and my mom called my dad down and he would always, you know, he had this kind of disciplining thing and he was like, what's going on? And he said, look, if you're not going to practice, we're taking the violin back to the shop. That's it. So make a decision. You're either going to practice and listen to your mother or we're taking the violin back. So that was the first time I think I like made a decision like, okay, I'd rather not lose the violin. So I think I'll practice. The next time that I think I really decided that I, I really fell in love with music was I was like 14 and I was going to the Chautauqua Summer Institute where it was a performing arts camp and it was just orchestra and chamber music and private practice all day long and the other kids that were there were doing dance or they were doing uh, theater or what is the other thing uh, art you know and uh, it's like eight weeks and that was life-changing for me you know so I would recommend if you if you have kids and they're 15 like you know give them that chance that really that was the only true conservatory environment I ever had because later on I went to Ohio State which I would say is not the same as maybe going to like a you know Oberlin or Juilliard or you know conservatory I think of as this place where people are just like it's all they do is eat breathe and sleep you know music you know and Ohio State's a little more broad of a place I, I'm, I'm not trying to I might be mischaracterizing it you can correct me if I'm wrong I, I guess depends how people define the word conservatory but but at Chautauqua that was my conservatory experience and that's when I really got the passion all right so yeah the the conservatory thing um so I mean generally the difference between conservatories and like schools of music or something that belong to like a university is that the university usually like you have to take these general education courses right you know and usually conservatories you'll have to take something but it's much more extensive in a university so so what that translates into is i mean it's essentially not as much time to practice because there's the because there's other stuff that to pursue um uh, but you know, I, I, I was, uh, talking to, um, uh, well, we were chatting, it was a Facebook chatting messenger and, uh, he's in another country right now. He's, uh, kind of stranded over there. Um, he's, he's with his wife. Um, but, uh, 
this this guy was known at Western Michigan University. He was known for just practicing all day. That's all like all he wanted to do was just practice. But in order to do that, he ended up being in school for like another year or another two years because the first couple of years, all he did was take music classes and practice. So he didn't take any of the general ed courses. Some, sometimes what happens um, at Ohio State to fil- facilitate more practicing is students, they, they take a lot of classes, general ed classes during the summer, you know, like that. And, um, but yeah, it's not, um, it's not exactly apples and apples between conservatories and universities. There's definitely a a difference in the, in the culture too. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. I mean, during the summer at Chautauqua, I guess I call, I don't know the right definitions, but I've always kind of thought of that as my conservatory experience because and and what i associate that with is being like six to eight weeks like just with kids that literally that's all they want to do is practice and they're super pumped up about it and that was a difference maker for me to be in that environment instead of in columbus where i was sort of more like you know the one kid in my school who was really passionate about music you know and i would go to like the youth or columbus and youth or something like that but this was like just constantly and um I remember I, heard, I met this girl who was like a year younger than me and she played this concerto with the orchestra and it was just, she sounded like a 70 year old woman, you know, like she just had that deep soul in her playing and that, and sort of stirred something inside of me. Probably it was a mixture of the girl and her playing that stirred something and it all kind of came together. And I just was like, I want to be a concert violinist. Oh. Like that's all, you know, I just knew that I wanted that from the time I was 14. And then after that, kind of excelled i came back and i really kind of set myself apart and i got like the concert master spot in the columbus symphony youth orchestra as a sophomore i think in, in in high school and then i really started to distinguish myself as a as a classical violinist but at the same time my friends in high school were some of my friends in high school were playing in a rock band and these guys had maybe bought a guitar and had one lesson bought a drum set had one lesson you know, bought a bass and had one lesson. And I got an electric bass and I started playing in this garage band with my friends. And I felt like I knew less about music than they did. And that was the beginning of kind of this, like at, at that point, it was like a split. It was like the classical musician and then like, what's this rock music thing? <laughs> you know, cause I was trying to deal with like improvisation and songwriting and like arranging and like, what are the chords and these are different rhythms and all this kind of stuff. And from then it became, it was this divergent kind of two musicians for a while until, and that's, you know, and that was sort of when I, I had, I looked at myself too. And I thought, I guess I'm not a creative type. I was jealous of my friends in the rock band cause I thought they were really creative and cool. And I thought that my virtuosity as a classical musician, I felt like it wasn't, you know, I, I felt bad about myself because I thought I wasn't creative. Mm. But then I thought, what if I could push back against that, that belief about myself and try to learn other kinds of music and try to be creative and have like an original personal voice. Cause I really saw that like, that was cool. Like just to be creative. And I wanted that. And so that began me on this path since I was like 16 years old and now I'm 49 of trying to kind of, claim that and find that and it was really divergent paths for a while but i would say that by the time i was 30 or something like that it kind of it kind of coalesced into the one musician that i am which is somebody who has very eclectic tastes um but i feel grounded as the person that i am within all the things that i do yeah so you you mentioned that you know you're you're a multi-instrumentalist um, you know, that you play bass and th- oh, do you play any other instruments? I play guitar and bass, you know, I mean, I don't spend a lot of time on them. I don't think like you, like I consider you like a true multi-instrumentalist. I, I used to, at times I used to spend more time on them, but now I've just put more time into, you know, using the violin, but arranging and composing and, and working on the music, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, I was, uh, in a conversation with uh, Walt Weisskopf, but also for the same uh, interview series, because um, Walt plays clarinet and and uh, and flute and you know, and at one time he played bassoon, and uh, uh, so 
<laughs> anyhow, you know, I was, I was asking him about that and he was like, well, I mean, I'm able to play those instruments, but you know, I've gotten to the place where I just want to play tenor saxophone. I'm just focusing on tenor saxophone. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and, uh, he said that that was, it's kind of been a relief for him actually to be able to kind of just focus on that and not feel like he has to keep those other things going. Um, and it makes me, it actually makes me reflect and think about what it is that I'm doing. You know, do I really need to be learning another instrument or should I be simplifying, um, and focusing on a particular thing more? Um, it's tough. It's, it's tough. I mean, you know, we both know Hamilton Harden, who is, uh, uh, he seems to make a strong case that if, if you want to play everything, <laughs> then you can, uh, <laughs> and right. you can do it really great. Yeah. So people like him are, you know, inspirations to me that keep me thinking, Hey, maybe it's okay for me to, you know, keep playing all these instruments um you know at some point i'm sure i'll get to the place where it's like okay i probably need to trim back because you know I, i'm just I, i'm just not going to get any time on anything you know but until i get to that point i think i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna keep holding my big pile of junk <laughs> i'm gonna keep hoarding my junk well, well, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, I, I, and I know that you similarly, like, I mean, you have so many interests in life outside of music as well, I think, and you yeah. take on so many responsibilities and I, you know, I do as well. And so like other things that I'm passionate about are like, you know, parenting and like, I, I'm passionate about, um, you know, writing. I do a lot of writing, like in my emails to my list and like blogging and yeah. stuff like that. And, and then I'm passionate about um, the business, you know, marketing and sales and, and, you know, the operations of a business. Um, but I'm also passionate about, um, you know, being like, a, um, well, I, I founded a nonprofit five or six years ago. So then that was like a can of worms because I was like, oh, well, this is a real thing. Like people learn about this too. Like what does it mean to run a nonprofit? And like I could spend my whole life trying to build that up like some people have. Uh, or just being like an influencer in the industry. And, you know, there's so many things that we could choose to like to put our energy into. And so I feel like it's about trying to clarify what is my vision, you know, for what do I want to achieve? And being a musician is part of that. And even what kind of musician I am is a part of that. Like, for example, when I was in my early 20s, like I was just obsessed with wanting to be able to swing and play like jazz language you know tradition like you know and be able to play the blues and like these kinds of things and like to like prove that i could meet some standard of, specifically on those those three points and then like i feel like for probably 10 more years i was just obs obsessed with that <clears throat> then i was in new york for a while and i got started to get obsessed with wanting to be able to do the things that i heard a lot of the the modern quote unquote modern players in new york doing and after a while <clears throat> I kind of, I kind of, it was a relief, like you said, to be like, you know, I don't need to prove anything. I need to find out who I am. And maybe that doesn't have to do with chops. And maybe it doesn't need, you know, maybe I don't need to check this box or check that box. It's like, I want to say something as an artist and saying something as an artist is not just about how fast I can play on the violin or how in tune I can play. It's about, it's about like more deep stuff. It's about confidence and purpose and uh you know intention and like you know self-acceptance and and the only way that i'm going to be able to do those things musically is if i can back it up with you know resources like you know and uh and and for me i've always been self-employed i mean i did teach at berkeley for a few years and i had a great time teaching at berkeley and um the only reason I left Berkeley at the same time that I left New York and I stopped playing, I was playing with Bill Evans on the road for many years and I let Les Paul, I left all that stuff and I moved to Columbus because to be a parent, because of parenting, because I wanted to be close to my child and I had been commuting for all those years. So in some ways that was an easy decision because it was like, I want to be close to my child. I'm going to Columbus. So it made it easier for me to kind of make that decision, but also 
the point is I'm self-employed and I identify as a self-employed person, like an entrepreneur for better or worse. I, I think that there's pros and cons to working, you know, a, a job or a few jobs versus working for yourself, you know? And, uh, but that was kind of something that I got from like my grandma, Dorothy, she was a, a, an entrepreneur and like my dad was an entrepreneur as a salesman. And I feel like it's just kind of part of how I am. And it was like one big choice that I made. And so once I made that choice, it was like, everything has to flow from that. And I think a lot of, you know, I, I don't mean to, what's the word? <laughs> I don't mean to push the conversation into this direction. It, it really just feels natural to me, but I feel like from my lens, it's like, you don't make something, I don't make anything artistic or creative unless there's resources for it, unless I create the resources. That means somebody's got to hire me. <laughs> I've got to have a client that's going to pay me money. And then that puts me in a position where I can create something. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of musicians see that the opposite way. They feel like I'm going to get good. And then once I'm good enough, opportunities are going to come. But I kind of disagree with that because just from my own experience, and part of this might have been the curse and the blessing of being a violinist, wanting to play jazz from the time I started my career when I was 24, there was no job openings for a jazz violinist in Columbus, Ohio. I look around, nobody was hiring, uh, nobody was looking to hire a, a jazz violinist. So that forced me to be like, I need to create my own work. And, and then that, then I kind of learned how to do it. And then from then on, I was like, well, this is what I do. But I really feel like I never would have played at the Newport Jazz Festival and, and, and learned what I learned from being on that stage or being in a room with Jack D. Jeanette for three days recording an album or playing with you. You know, I like, I never would have gotten those formative musical experiences unless I asked for them. And I, and I feel like that is really the biggest skill that I see a lot of musicians don't have. Mm -hmm. I feel like the most critical thing for somebody who works for themselves and for any business, if you want to succeed in the music business or in any business and therefore grow as an artist, then the single most important thing I believe is that you've got to be willing to offer your services to the right people consistently and appropriately over time. And I feel like that that's the single biggest thing missing for most self-employed yeah. musicians because they believe that if they're good enough, the world should just like come to them. And I just don't believe that at all. You know, um, you're talking about the self-employed or freelance, you know, versus, uh, musicians that are employed by an institution right employed by a school or an institution or a, right, a right. band leader or yeah anything and you know i see i see there being also this uh, sort of a third option or stream which is is a hybrid yeah because most folks now have some kind of stable teaching gig that sort of subsidizes their other other activities um and something being one of those those people something that i notice is that the let's talk about academia just for a for a second here and I can talk this way because I have tenure, so they can't do anything to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll try to stay uh, in my lane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the longer a faculty member, say, the longer, say, whatever instrument someone teaches, some applied lesson teacher, whatever, the longer they teach that instrument after tenure, the less actually connected to the actual music industry they actually need to be to be able to sustain, you know, employment, right? Sure. Up until when you get tenure, they want you to be okay, who you're playing with, what are you doing, X, Y, and Z. But Prove once yourself. you get tenure, right. yeah, yeah, 
then, and there's a lot of, uh, in many institutions, there's a lot of uh, professors that they have a great reputation and they recruiting like crazy. But, you know, they've been in the ac academic bubble for 30 years, 25 years. And so it's very difficult to know what's happening in the actual music industry and therefore to be able to provide instruction, information, you know, to the student that's going to help them out, you know, uh, that's going to, I mean, in other words, I'm not going to hear, there's not going to be a whole lot of situations uh, where the faculty member, the instructor is going to tell the student the kinds of things that you're able to tell them. You know, which I think are, are the kind of things that are, are as you were, were suggesting, are actually more important than the actual development of the art. Now, I'm not saying that you can have, you know, a terrible, that, that I'm not trying to promote terrible music or right. stuff that's not, you know, worth anything. Because, uh, but what's more important, that last little refinement you know, or actually getting out there and start busting, busting it to figure out how to actually make a living, you know. So, I don't know. It's just, I have, I have uh, several issues with the pretty, you know, status quo, common approach, um, you know, in academia, the conservatory model, as they call it. I have I have several issues with it because it seems to leave a lot of uh, leave a lot of stuff undone. And, and certainly you can hire people uh, like at a Berkeley or or heck or at Ohio, an Ohio State or at any institution. You can hire people that know that information. That's great, but the institution has to be set up to support that. And I don't know that we're there yet. I think that there's been some development in moving towards that direction. But I think one thing that this quarantine has showed us, this whole pandemic has showed us, is that um, none of us were really ready. None of us were really ready it's in academia as far as for delivering the kind of content quality content to students you know um in this different kind of format with all the video stuff a lot of people it was a huge a steep learning curve um i don't know that i don't i don't think anybody was really ready for it and i hope that's a teachable moment for the future and, and i hope that we use this what's happened now not just as a way to learn the technology yeah learn the technology figure that stuff out but maybe to cause a maybe a paradigm shift even if it's even if it's a subtle one so now you have a you you have a uh, creative strings camp and you were talking about bringing me in to to teach uh, i was really impressed by that um the your your camp and uh the things that were going on uh the playing you know uh, the energy, uh, the, your interaction with the students, um, uh, it's very, very, uh, I had a very positive experience. You want to talk a little bit about how you got that started and, um, yeah. Well, I mean, again, I mean, it arose out of that, that kind of that entrepreneurial necessity. And in fact, I remember having a conversation with my dad up in Delaware at his house, because when I was living in New York city, I would commute back to Columbus, uh, to see uh, my, my first child all the time. I'd stay at my dad's house and I'd drive back and forth to New York. And one time my dad said, why don't you invite people to come to Columbus and spend like, you know, a few days with you and you just teach them what you're passionate about. And because, <clears throat> you know, I'm this guy that was sort of on the outs everywhere. I mean, the symphony, you know, when I was 24, the Columbus Symphony Orchestra hired me. Um, I basically to be a full-time sub, which is a good job. You know, it's just like, you don't have the contract, but you're like guaranteed, like it's good money. And it's like, there's a lot of people that play in symphony orchestras is what they call full-time sub, you know? And, uh, um, <clears throat> but at the same time, 
my dad, because I was like, what am I going to do? I'm 24. I want to play jazz violin, but I don't know how I'm going to do it. And my dad said, I'll tell you what, I'll, tell, I'll teach you how to do it. And I, was, and I was like, are you sure? He was like, yeah. And what he told me to do, and I've done it for the last 25 years, and I attribute not only my financial freedom or whatever you want to call it, but also my artistic growth, I attribute to this. Because he said, Chris, I want you to, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going backwards, but it's going to lead up to the other. Oh, story. no, 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 no. That's cool. <laughs> and, he, he said, Chris, call every restaurant manager in town and offer to do a free audition. He said, you, you know, and um, so I called 15 restaurant managers and I offered to go show up for a half an hour and play for free. And if they liked it, I wanted to negotiate a weekly gig. So of those 15, eight said, yes, I did eight auditions. Of those eight, four said yes to a weekly gig, and one of them gave me two nights. So all of a sudden, I had five weekly gigs. This was like, this all happened within three weeks. And, um, and uh, so then I had five gigs during the week. One was a Saturday brunch, one was Saturday night, Friday night, Thursday night, Tuesday night, something like this. And the, each of the gigs paid me personally somewhere between 75 and 200 bucks. So I was, I was looking at like 600 bucks a week. The symphony was going to pay me about 600 bucks a week. 1996, it's decent money. Six, I mean, right now, 600 bucks a week is decent money for, for five <laughs> nights a week. You know, I mean, you're, you're only talking about 20 hours of work, you know. So, um, so I said, hey, thanks, Columbus Symphony. But, you know, I'd want to do this because uh, I was going to be under my own name and I could hire people like Bobby Floyd and learn from them on the gig about jazz, which is I was really passionate about. I could play different kinds of music. And then like also it would like my name was on the marquee, even if it was Cap City Diner or Spaggio's like brunch restaurant or whatever, like it didn't matter. It was still a marquee and it was mine. And like right, I got to right. call the shots musically, but most importantly, I was excited about learning the music because nobody was going to hire me to play jazz violin. So, but I had the gig and that's what enabled me to get to play with Bobby Floyd. Because Bobby Floyd and the best musician in any town, I don't care who they are, if you come at them with respect, it could be Dr. Wallace himself. If you call Dr. Wallace with respect and you say, sir, would you play this gig with me? You come at him right. I mean, he's probably going to at least consider it. And so, and that's how I came at Bobby. And Bobby, you know, because Bobby is so generous also, and he is like true, like University of the Streets, you know, like he's always bringing people up. And so he was gracious enough to come out and play those gigs with me, man. And you know how much I learned from playing duo gigs with Bobby Floyd. Can you believe, I mean, can, I can't oh, yeah. even, I can't even tell you like what an education that was like conservatory conservatory. I got to play duo gigs oh, with yeah. Bobby Floyd. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the, Bobby's the baddest. Um, uh, I also interviewed him for this series. And okay. one thing that came out, um, when I was reflecting about his interview was the fact that he played in a band with my dad. Wow. You know, my, uh, so, you know, back in the day he played in a band with my dad and, and, uh, it's a, it's a really small world. I remember moving back to Columbus and one of the first keyboard players that I, that I, that I booked was Bobby Floyd. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that yeah, Bobby's the, the Bobby's the baddest, and I told him I told him this in the interview, you know, every every time we play together. Now, well, first of all, you know, he records everything, right? Right, I know so all the time he records everything, yeah. and and I told him, you know, I record everything too, especially when Bobby Floyd is on the gig. <laughs> I have a lot of Bobby Floyd footage, yeah, some you know secret stuff, you know. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a bad dude. He's a and and he's so as you as you said, he's so generous, so generous. Um, but yeah, what a what a great approach to hustling some gigs up. Um, you know, that one time free, one time free, and I've used that one time free model for the last twenty five years for everything. So I mean, it was you know I I started with that and I was doing that for five years in Columbus and then I play at the restaurants and then people hired me for private things and then you know I built out from that and then um, really I just continued to do that for twenty five years. And there's a lot of people that say, well, how can you know how can I work? You can go out and play on the corner. You can go play on the street. Yep. Maybe not during 
quarantine, but I mean, any other. <laughs> I respect, Just have your mask on. <laughs> I respect the busters because I feel like there's nothing better. You know, the thing is that it was only by me offering to people to give that value first and then off asking for the gig. That's what enabled me to then learn to be a better jazz musician from playing six gigs a week for years yeah. and playing tunes and learning from people. And that's where I really developed, you know, a lot of that stuff. And, and that was, and then when I went to New York, it was the same thing. It was like, you know, reaching out to people, offering value up front, you know, maybe for example, I might offer to give some, uh, to pay somebody for a lesson. Like when I went to New York, there was like, let's say there was like five improvising violin players. So I called each one of them up and I offered to pay him for a lesson. You know, you show a little bit of respect and you show some kind of value up front and then that gets you an audience and it gives you the opportunity to show, to, to, to gain no like and trust. And, and you always got to come from a place of service. And, you know, yeah. it, it's like, you know, the pairing, what people miss about sales is it's the pairing of being aggressive and following up with people with a service mindset. If you really have a service mindset, there is nothing wrong with, I mean, offer, you know, it's like, like I'm not a, a Christian, but if one of my Christian friends comes to me with a service mindset, they want to help me. They say, Hey man, can I talk to you about, you know, Christianity or whatever? Like I'm never going to hold that against them. You know what I mean? And, and I think like, you know, and wouldn't you sell your friend on that? If you were a Christian, I mean, wouldn't, you know, because you want to give them something that you believe that is good for them. And I think that it's the same idea around sales and it gets the wrong thing. But so many musicians are unwilling to get over themselves. And it's, it's actually their ego that prevents them from asking and humbling themselves. I think. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. And, uh, you know, being honest, you know, I've been one of those musicians that has really struggled with that. Um, historically I've struggled with that and it hasn't been until relatively recently that I have kind of broken out of that and decided that, Hey, you know, if, if I'm not willing to talk about myself and if I'm not willing to ask for the sale, it's not going to happen magically. Pe people are not going to just, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It, you know, <clears throat> you know, the old, the old saying, you know, the, 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 the kid that just started playing violin or something, right. You know, you know, what's the, what's the way to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. And, you know, that's a great thing to tell a kid. And, and I mean, you, are you really going to start by trying to j get the kid jaded <laughs> by telling them about all of the hogwash? That's, well, I would tell <laughs> them what evolved. you said earlier. I would tell them what you said earlier, which is honor your word. Mm. Actually. Because to me, it's, look, and, and here's a couple things I like to say to people. Like, think about the people you know. Do you know somebody who's super, super, super talented and doesn't get a lot of work? Okay. Now, do you know somebody who's maybe not as talented, but making t tons of cash and gets all the work? Yeah. You know, because business is about business. I don't care if you're running a restaurant. Look, eight out of 10 restaurants fail. Not because they don't make good food because they can't run a business, you know, and, and to the general public, they don't know the difference between, you know, a Dr. Wallace and, you know, some other saxophone player. They don't know the difference between me and one of my students. The general public doesn't know the difference. And honestly, a band leader is going to rather hire one of my students if that student shows up on time and is supportive and helpful and they have a baseline of ability. I will always hire a drummer or a piano player or whatever who is less talented that I trust. Yeah. That I trust to not mess with my money. Cause at the end of the day, that's right. That's right. The money. Cause, cause at the end of the day, I'm a father. I got two kids in school, so you can talk to me about the music all you want, but you know, I'm, you know, you can talk to me <laughs> on my way to the bank, you know, while yeah. I'm paying tuition checks for my kids and I'm, and I'm giving my wife, you know, some money to go to whole foods. Cause at the end of the day, I'm straight on that. Yep. You know, and I think that we have to get straight on where our priorities align, you know, and it's like even in the last two months, I've made like a hundred play along lessons for nine year olds. I never would have made play along lessons for nine year olds when I was 25 because I was so caught up in wanting to prove that I could swing. 
You know what I mean? But now I'm really straight on who I am and what my purpose in his lo- in life is. And I see that like me playing, play, making play long lessons for nine year olds, that is serving nine year olds. And I'm proud to do it. And I'm proud to do it well. And anybody can talk whatever they want about me, you know? And it's like, because, you know, I'm taking that, those checks and I can fund whatever creative <laughs> work I want right, to do. That's right. Plus, plus there, there is this, this angle on this, you know, if somebody's watching this and they're like, well, I'm just not there yet, whatever, you know, um, there is this angle and that is material that you're providing for nine, nine year olds or, uh, for anybody that is younger than, than we are. Right. You're, you're potentially actually growing the music market. Right. Because they're going to grow up to appreciate music and potentially later on, they're going to be in a position where they can patronize one of your events, concert, you know, get some lessons. I mean, there's there's all kinds of ways that that can actually uh, feed back into it. Not that that should be the thing that you're focusing on, because I think it can start to seem uh, to the, to a client, like you're just trying to pump them for money. But if, if you have a, an actual positive reason for doing it, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with acknowledging that some of these other things are associated or, or can be outgrowth, natural outgrowth of that. You know, um, we're kind of, you know, we're just, we're, we're just talking in conversations. They go how conversations go and and that's great um i i wanted to to say this thing about social media so when you t- when you were talking about the first one is free you know that that sort of principle the, that's what jumped into my head immediately is social media now the problem though it seems that with social media is that um is is monetizing the subscriptions, so to speak. So people are pumping out all of this free content. I'm, I'm the same way. I'm, there's a lot of free content that I'm pumping out. But trying to find a way to monetize that content, you know, it's like, when do I ask for a payment? When do I you know, when, when is that part of it going to happen? It's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, kind of nebulous. It's a, and it's a topic that not many folks are really talking about, at least not in the music community. I think there's a lot of con, especially right now, <laughs> especially right now when a lot of musicians don't have any work and people are trying to reinvent themselves and they're trying to f- figure, okay, you know, how do I do all this stuff? What do I do? I mean, I'm, I'm sure this is something that you think about probably all the time. Absolutely. So I'm, um, so I'm curious. Yeah. Well, like you said, the, people don't necessarily talk about it in the music community, but in the marketing world, they do. And business is business. And so, you know, I think that like happens in every field, you know, you can go down and talk to your music we can, any of us can talk to our music friends and the kind of the, like the word on the street, if you're hanging at the club, then music people will talk about the music business. But that to me is not the best place to learn about business. You want to, you want to be studying business. And, you know, so I've been studying business from that first moment. I told you that my dad was telling me about sales and I was buying books on sales, but that I've studied dig- digital marketing and funnels and all this other stuff. And, you know, I've been doing online marketing for 15 years, content marketing, all this stuff. And yeah, absolutely. If you talk to any good marketing consultant, they will answer the question about how do you do this balance of putting out free content and, and, you know, how do you get more of a, um, a cohesive business model together. So what I would say simply for most people is like, it, you know, like, first of all, the reason I am on social media is for my business. Like my wife's not on social media because she doesn't like social media. Well, she doesn't need to, she doesn't have a business. She doesn't have a business on social media. You know, I don't do anything on social media just because it's personal or, I mean, I will, I'll, I'll share personal things, but the reason I invest time in social media is for business period. Yeah. So yeah. other people could be different, but, um, 
but you want to have some offers. You want to have some offers in mind. And if you're giving away free stuff, then you want to have in the back of your mind, what are the offers that I can give people? The offer could be come take one free lesson with me and then sign up to be my student. The offer could be buy my course, buy my transcription, buy my album, come to my show, book my band. I mean, it, it goes on and on and on. Come to my camp. You know, all these things are offers that I have. You know, uh, give me your email address for this free thing that I'll give you. You know, I've probably got 20, 30 offers right now. If you go to my website, you can you can buy actually probably like 45 different things from me right now. Anywhere from $1 to $15. And um, a lot of people just don't, they're not, they don't have an offer. And they're not pushing the offer. And and now for someone like you, and I, you know, I don't want to speak for you, but I would think someone like yourself who has a few key clients, you know, such as a high school university or a major church or, you know, a few key clients, you know, that, it, that there may be a different rationale for a person in your type of position, which is more brand awareness and building for bigger opportunities. And, you know, that could come right, now right, in the future, right. you know, because it's like, you know, it, because if somebody's like, hey, I heard there was this hot, you know, saxophone player in Columbus, let me check them out. Well, they can see 200 videos from Dr. Wallace on YouTube, and they're going to know, not only going to know that you can play this instrument, that instrument, the other instrument, but they're going to know everything about you. And they're going to be like, I trust this guy. I like this guy. This guy is smart. This guy is soulful. He's interested in this, 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 and this. They're going to feel like they know you. And so they're not going to have any qualms about hiring you for that tour or paying you for that big thing or whatever. So to me, that's like, that's a, that's a no brainer. Like just all that stuff you put out there, it just creates that no like, and trust for whenever you're ready to make your move or for whatever the situation that somebody is vetting you. Like even like when I hired you for, for the gig or whatever, like I, we knew each other, we were friends, you know, so it wasn't really an issue, but the, all the content that you've made did influence me because it told me this guy is serious. You know, this guy is making his own YouTube videos and the most people aren't doing that, you know, and, and I knew like you about your productivity thing. In fact, I was like, I know I can hire Doc Wallace to give this lecture because he's given the lecture on YouTube. Otherwise, just because I knew you were a great saxophone player and the director of a jazz studies department, I would not hire you based on that. Even us being good friends, I would have not hired you to give a lecture for my string players, but for I knew all those other things. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes, I mean, it makes total sense. And, you know, when I first started, you know, so I, I've been a content creator since 05. And, um, you know, of course, before that I was, you know, uh, recordings and <laughs> albums, stuff like that. And of course I still do that now, but, but as far as online content, that started in 2005 right. and, uh, it started out with these videos that I called lesson of the week and those videos, um, were about 10 minute, uh, clips of lessons from my studio at Ohio state. And honestly, I recorded those lessons for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons I recorded all of my lessons, all of my lessons was because I wanted to be a better teacher. Right. Single best way to do it. That's right. So I would view the stuff back and I was like, oh, that wasn't that great. Okay, this could it be better. And I was just borrowing from a, you know, the, you know, uh, the good advice that any good teacher would, would give you about your playing. Listen to yourself more often. Absolutely. If you don't like what you hear, then what are you doing to fix it? You know? So, so I just applied that to my teaching. But honestly... A second reason, um, uh, a, a second reason, hash, hashtag me too. Um, mm, right. Right. Say was, no more. right. When I, yeah. when I started the job, I, I was 29. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, I, I, you know, I talked to ad administrators at the university. I was, I was concerned about, you know, what, what if somebody makes an allegation or something? What, what kind of, you know, support system is the school going to be for the faculty me member? And I remember uh, talking to one faculty member in, in particular, and I said, so, you know, what's my defense? 
You know, what, what can I, what could I do? And he said, look innocent. That's what he told me. He said, look innocent. That's my, that's supposed to be my defense. Look innocent. And, and honestly, initially I thought it was like a flippant, like, you know, yeah. I'm not going to really tell you what it is kind of answer. But when I started thinking about it more, I was like, you know what? That was actually some real good advice. Um, and because what he was saying was, if you have a clean track record and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, this weird allegation comes out of place, then it's likely that people are not going to believe that. Okay. Um, certainly your employer is not going to believe that. Okay. Um, but I just, I just one upped it. I was like, well, look innocent. <laughs> okay. Bring me the allegations. Okay. Here's, here's the, here's the date that you said that this happened. Okay. Let's, let's roll the tape. Okay. Now where, where is it at? <laughs> you know, so, so I had it's actually some other reasons, but when I looked back at the, at the recordings, I was like, man, this might be some good material. I think this could be a way to, uh, <coughs> to get some recruiting, you know, without having to go anywhere, you know, um, you know, it's a long list of things. And to this day, it's almost not possible for me to go to jazz conference or, I mean, I, w I was on tour with the Count Basie Orchestra and we were at, uh, What's the name of that club? We were in London. I can't Ronnie think of Scott's. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, exactly. Uh, I was, I was there, and uh, and the guy comes up to me. He said, "Hey, man, when are you gonna start doing those lesson of the week videos again? Man, I got so much out of those. So, so I can be halfway around the world, and people, you know, they 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 know me from that. Um, and I kind of slowed down with some of the content, and recently, um, the you know, cause I had other things going on. Uh, but recently I've reinvigorated that and re rebranded the stuff that I'm doing. Um, and honestly, I look up to you as far as the kind of, you, you were talking about having offers. That's been a, that's been a weakness of mine. Okay. And like I said, it's part of the reason is because, um, honestly, I, 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 I didn't know what I thought about that. I didn't know how, how that was going to make me feel about my art, about what it was that I was trying to do. And, you know, I had these like altruistic reasons for, you know, for playing music and stuff. And I, I didn't know how that was going to align with that. Now I see that it's a, it is such a critical part of what it is that we do um, to be, to, to be able to, to ask for a sale, to have the confidence in what it is that we do to the extent that we can ask people to support it. And, and the, uh, yeah. yeah. And the confidence that, it, well, you know, so many people talk about like valuing the arts and advocacy for the arts, but <clears throat> advocacy to me is just about, it's advocating for the value of something is saying, man, I want you to have this, because it's going to make your life better. So, right. uh, you know, I'm, I'm enrolling you. And that's what a university does when they recruit, you know, and they show interest in that person. And that's what a church does that's right. when they recruit. Because it's like, we want to bring this, this to you out of service. Right. And I feel like for us as musicians, we have to recognize that, like, our role is to provide a service to the world and we have to uh, so we have to be able to stand up for the value of it it's like i i want you to come to my creative strings workshop because i want to change your life i want to teach yeah. you a classical violin player i want to teach you about improvisation and creativity because it's going to make such a difference for you and this is worth fifteen hundred dollars and i want you to pay that money because you're going to get it back a thousand times over and like, you know, so it's, I'm very much a stand for the value, but I'm coming from service. And I think that's any business, a university is a business, a church is a business, you know, and an individual musician is a business. Whether you're trying to perform for somebody or make art for somebody, it still doesn't matter. It's like, I want to give you this art. It's my original art. Okay. I don't care if it's modern art, traditional art, whatever it is, this is my gift to you in the world. And it has this value and I'm asking you pay me for it. 
Yeah. And there's there's like a disconnect for people to do that, but I feel like it's the same any university, any church. They're not going to have they're not going to have a constituency unless they ask, unless they bring it to the people. Yeah, you know, um, I I think it, it's only possible to develop uh, this sort of uh, head in the sand approach to this if if your artistic life has been lived in a bubble you know if <laughs> you know what i'm saying cuz cuz you know cuz rent is due and lights i got to pay these lights and i got to do you know the that that stuff has a that has a real way of i mean and and look i'm not hating on anybody for using this pandemic as uh, a, a great motivator to force them to start doing some stuff that they probably should have been doing for a long time. I'm not hating on anybody for that, but my suggestion for everybody and to myself is that um, now, of course, I started doing a, the stuff that I'm doing, you know, way way before the, <laughs> the you know the pandemic, and I think that's why the stuff is rolling the way that it is right now. Right. And you, of course you, the same thing, the stuff is rolling now because the, you didn't have to invent anything new. Right. You know, you were probably taking advantage of certain opportunities that may not have been there, but you, your infrastructure had already been developed. That yeah. was already there. Yeah. But for those that have are in the midst of developing their infrastructure now, just, don't allow it to just be a thing that you're just doing now. Keep doing it. Yeah. Keep it going. Don't 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 stop because oh hey the gigs are coming back now. Okay, so now I don't have to do that. Look, increasingly we're in a situation where uh, you're going to have to. I mean, basically forever and ever on men, it's not going to be the same again. I mean, I mean we can we can we can hope and pray that it'll get back to some kind of fraction of what it was but it's going to be a long long time before it's anywhere similar to what it was like yeah well i i mean even without the pandemic i mean i was talking to some you know first tier cats in in, in new york city that had told me a couple last year two years ago hey you know in europe they're not hiring like they used to they're not paying like they used to you know so things always change and you know we all go through cycles of our life where you know that one person who was paying your bills they may not be there so you know just having more this independent um mindset i and, and being prepared for whatever is good i mean i just give you a couple examples of what i was talking about also with how i think applies to you but applies to your your question about content so like for example a real true life story fact two that share the exact same message i was going to minneapolis i asked somebody tell me a good drummer in minneapolis they said oh check this person out i went and i saw that person on a youtube video in two different videos swinging sounded great but I knew that I wanted a drummer who could also play backbeat and swing on the same gig. I couldn't find any other videos that showed that drummer playing backbeat. So I passed him over. So that's why, you know, again, going back to like, you know, why, why Dr. Wallace, you're so prepared because it's like, I know that you've got this, 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 and this, but what I wanted to see, but could he lecture on this? Like you had that too, you know? So it's like your content should be aligned with the thing that you want to show people that you can do. You know, and it's like, so everything you, and I mean, I had like, uh, what is the word? Like a chip on my shoulder, you know, because I always felt like nobody accepted me in the classical or the jazz world. So I was like, I'm going to show them. I'm going to show mm -hmm. I can swing. I'm going to show I can play blues. I'm going to show I can play fast. And every time it was something new, I made a video. You, Oh, you don't think I can play Latin? Let me make a Latin video. You don't think I can teach? Let me make a teaching video. You don't yeah, think I can yeah. teach nine-year-olds? Let me make a teach, teach nine-year-olds video. It's like, so, but it's always attached to this thing you want to show. Because because yeah. people don't know until they see it. And the other example was I had a student from, from China or Taiwan who was like, I'm going to get a master's in, in, in the United States. Tell me three, uh, you know, directors to talk to, the violin player. I think I might have given him, him yours might have been one of them. And, mm -hmm. and, and, but he, he reached out to three directors, but he said, 
This one did not have any YouTube videos, so I didn't I didn't email that person. I like I gave him three names of directors I knew, and one of them didn't have YouTube, so so that university didn't even get a chance at that money. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, so I mean, that's just those are just like really clear cases in point. But I mean, you want that's why you want to have content is because people hire who they know, like, and trust, and uh, yeah. Sorry, I just want to make. Uh, no, no, that's. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm lining them up, and you're you're <laughs> you're knocking them down. Um, so, uh, one thing I wanted to say, uh, you know, and you know, I I hope if there is a professor or something that's watching this video, um, that they could take this for what I mean it to be. Um, you know, I don't see myself as being any better or any, or special or anything like that, but I have taken advantage of, uh, free ways to promote what it is that I do. And, um, iTunes U, for instance, I, I have been, uh, I have been, or, or I, I stopped since then, but starting in like 2006 or something, um, I was publishing to iTunes U. And the reason I did that, um, the reason I did that was because I saw that there were uh, uh, several universities that were uh, uploading as podcasts entire lecture series. I'm, I'm talking about week one to week 14 of an entire class. Right. And some of them were video and some of them were just audio. Some of them also had the link content, you know, and I was like, wait a minute here. <laughs> so this is this is serious right here, because this is this is this is something that nobody is really talking about. Um, and, and I struggled mightily to find any, you know, significant music content. There were some like. Um, theory classes and some music history cl classes and stuff like that. But as far as like applied lessons or uh, or any of that kind of stuff, I, I I didn't see I didn't see much of that or any of that at all. So I was like, hey, this is where this is a place that I can get in. Um, but I'm just I'm just saying if you don't have YouTube, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and honestly. Dare I say TikTok? Because I, you know, you you have to see where the students actually are, and TikTok is bigger than Instagram. Actually, it's way bigger than Facebook, and kids will tell you that Facebook is for their parents. Yeah, I well, I agree. Yeah, I think you're right about it's, that. I, but I, and I would say that I mean, for a lot of people, I would say I would slightly differ, and I would say find any one lane where you can make content at least. Oh yeah. 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 And just definitely. do it well. You know, right. it's like YouTube is enough. Like just, you know, and it's I, like, I agree. And if you have the bandwidth to add all these other things, then yeah, like pick yeah. one at a time and really focus and, you know, but I think one of the big mistakes that people make and the reason they don't do it is because they're focused on numbers, but it's not about numbers. It's about, it's about just the right people seeing the right thing about you. I mean, it, it does, the numbers right. don't matter. And everybody, that's why I say, I think it's an ego thing. And that's part of the reason I respect you so much, you know, because you just put it out there. You're not afraid to show people who you are and who you're not. And it's like, you know, and, but I feel like that's also why I feel like this thing about entrepreneurship and music, it comes back to personal development and it comes up with, it comes back to us being comfortable in our own skin. Mm -hmm. Just saying, like, this is who I am. Take me or, or take me for take me or leave me, you know. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like that's part of why I respect you so much, man, because you just you put it all out there. You're whether you're playing a flute or a keyboard or like you know, every, like you know, you're not perfect. None of us are perfect, but you just put it out there, man. And that's what it's about, in my opinion, you know. Because if people are gonna hire you because they like you and and, and trust you, not because you're the flavor of the month, you know, and everybody in the, in the jazz world, a lot of people in the, in the music world, it's like being in high school and it's like, everybody wants to be the, like the prom king or something. 
and like that the, the, they want to have the it factor they think i'm going to have the it factor and it's all going to come to me but that's not what it's about no you got to just you got to put yourself out there and let the people that you can resonate just resonate just for them those are your people it's like the thousand fans you know what i mean it's mm -hmm. like that one person at ronnie scott it's like you got those thousand people that resonate with you dr wallace and that's why you're always going to be all right man and as long as you're able to follow up, you know, you're, there's always going to be people that are going to bat for you because they're going to be like, I know this guy. I mean, me and you don't even have to have a conversation for two years. I see so much stuff that you're doing online. It's like, you know, it's, you know, it's like that supplements the relationship. It creates and, li and likewise. And, and I, uh, and I get your emails. Right. <laughs> yeah. And which, which I think by the way, are very well written, and very you. engaging. Um, and that's that's something, you know, that's definitely something I can learn from you uh, is is I mean, they're very engaging and, and each email seems fresh. I mean, you, you, you have to repeat yourself. You have to say things that are generally the same, but you always find a nuanced way to kind of find a different angle, which, um, uh, you know, I find. Uh, yeah, it's it's yeah that's it's it's really <laughs> that's really together man i'm 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 trying to get some of that from you well thanks i mean you know what you do with this youtube content is a, i think a similar way of developing a relationship being in front of people and stuff like that and i mean one simple thing you could do is just send, every time you make stuff just send it to your audience you know because that would just be a right. way to talking about leverage because you're making all this great content and if you just write to everybody on your list and be like hey i wanted you to show you these five things i did in the last two weeks hope you enjoy them this is about this one if you're interested in productivity check this out if you want to learn about what chris house said about this or what hamilton said about that you know that's value for your audience and you're giving them something i think the email game is something anybody can do because everybody's got 50 people on their email list and so anybody can like send, you know, I mean, it's some work, you know, but I mean, just being in front of your email list uh, and I've been working on my email list for like 15 years and I've got 14,000 people on the list and I write them about once a week. But you know, the email marketers that I study from, they say email every day, man. <laughs> I mean, think about that. Man. So, you know, and there's a lot of people out there to like get on my newsletter and they send once a month and it's like, that's not where it's at. No. And, and it, it's interesting. This, this, this pace, the uh, the space between contact, um, is is critically important. Uh, they say on YouTube, for instance, you have to upload at least one per week. If you don't upload at least one per week, then the algorithm, the YouTube will not suggest you. It will not suggest you because it doesn't know that you're dependable. You know that you're that you're reliable to, for new content, and and whatever you want to say about YouTube, YouTube is a business, and they're trying to make money. And um, I think sometimes people get upset because it's like, oh yeah, well YouTube is throttling my content, or or YouTube is you know they have whatever their political agenda is, and so they're trying to squash the little guy or whatever wh whatever stuff that people say. YouTube is a business, you know, it's a business. And so they have to do things that make money. And so if you're not going to consistently upload, you're not going to get suggested. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, you know, I, I went through the whole thing where I was posting all the time and then I wasn't posting for a long time, you know, and then now I'm back to regularly posting and regularly posting it it sort of snowballs you know like you know people uh, and then plus and then plus your fans get used to you know kind of you know checking out the stuff that you're doing and so then when you stop doing it they actually miss it for a little bit and say hey man when are you going to come out with another video and that's a but you, you but you can't you you have to develop that you you have to um you have to cultivate that in your listeners they have to, or the people that are watching you, 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 you're doing it often enough that they're like, okay. And then when you don't do it for a week, it's like, oh, so I, I miss that, you know, but you have to be doing it for a while to set that up. So it's, it's true. I mean, I just, I mean, like I've been doing YouTube a long time, 
like you, you know, maybe not as long as you actually, but I mean, at least since 2008 or 2010, but I had done like, I don't know, 200 uploads in like 10 years. And I got had like 1.5 million views or something like this. And, um, you know, then when the pandemic started, I was just like, I, I, st I thought for about 30 seconds and I was like, I started publishing multiple videos every day. Yeah. And so since then, it's been like seven weeks, I think I put up 95 videos. And, uh, and now I've just decided that I'm going to be uh, publish a video on my YouTube channel every single day. Yeah, indefinitely. that's what's happening. And, that's and I mean, as long as I can maintain it. And of course, you know, there's some there's some uh, method to the madness. Like what I'll do is like on Sunday, I'll take like two hours and I'll make like, you know, I'll make like seven videos, you know what I mean? And mm. each one's like maybe five to 10 minutes long or whatever, you know, and then I just post them throughout the week. But, uh, but it made me realize, it made me realize, Sean, that like I was holding back, man. Like I was holding yeah. back, you know what I mean? And the email game too, it's the same thing. It's like, why am I holding back? If people don't want to be on my list, they don't need to be on my list, but I'm going to try to serve them. I'm going to try to give them value. If they don't want to show up, they don't have to show up. It's my ego getting in the way. Yeah, so, you know, you're talking about the, uh, since the quarantine, the regularity of videos, more content, and, you know, I've done the same thing, um, you know, when I started doing these quarantine interviews. I mean, uh, if I'm, if my numbering is correct, this is episode 38. Wow. You know, and these are long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm just, uh, and I just decided I'm going to, I'm going to get it happening, and I'm, I'm interviewing five days a week. It's amazing. And, uh, yeah, you know, I just, I, I just decided, Hey, I, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to get some more content out. And I said something to you before we started rolling about pivoting. You know, I, I love what I do. You know, I love teaching in, but you know, I, I'm not going to be doing what I'm doing forever. And, um, you know, it's and I think this is a good time to maybe discover something, uh, maybe a hidden talent, so to speak. Um, you know, with uh, conducting these interviews, because there's a lot of folks that I would love to, you know, ask them questions and just like we're, we're talking and I'm, you know, I'm digging for gold, you know, and it's 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 definitely for the audience. I definitely want the audience to to uh, to learn from these, uh, but it's for me. It's for me, honestly. I mean, I'm I'm digging for myself too. I'm I want to know th these answers. It's interesting to me and edifying to me. You know. Well, I don't know if you know my little brother Lewis, but he he has a podcast called The School of Greatness, and it's in the iTunes top fifty. The School of Greatness. It's all just interviews, and he's he's had I don't know two hundred million downloads. I mean, he's a, he's like a big celebrity. He's like thirty five, but he built it. And but he says the same thing. He said he just did this because he wanted to learn from people that he respected. And, and, and uh, you know, so I think it's great. But also, I feel like you and me, I'm, I'm just guessing, but I feel like you and me both, we enjoy, like, you know, we enjoy what we're doing. Te you're teaching at OSU and at the church, you know, all the things that we're doing right now. Um, but I think we both see ourselves as being on a path and that, like, taking a teaching job is not, like, compromising on that path it's helping us sustain that path. Like we want to be great artists. You know, we want to be self-expressed. We want to be leaders in the community or whatever it is, you know, however you express that. But I think a lot of people, uh, some, some musicians are afraid that like teaching would be some kind of like admitting defeat or something, but I don't see it that way at all, man. Like I got to stand toe to toe with you, like, <laughs> you know, at, with the Columbus jazz orchestra, like, like I'm still like, I'm still excited about that. That was two years ago. Like, you know, like we can keep living for those moments. It's not like we're, you know, and I feel, I feel that that's, that's what I perceive about you. And even talking about like showing it in different strengths and in different ways, that's all an extension of our creative potential, whether it's being an interviewer or an email writer or a teacher. It's like, I think it, it can make us better musicians. It can make us better artists and better people. And I think that more, the more that, Everybody can think that way in a holistic way about your vision for your life and not get sucked up into the smallness of like, who's the flavor of the month in the jazz scene. You know what I mean? It's like, who's got all the gigs, you know, it's like, come on, man. You know, 
<laughs> you know, it's like there's lots of opportunities to serve out there. You there, know? there definitely are. Hey, uh, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe plug something um, and maybe talk about a few uh, maybe things that you that are percolating and that you're about ready to release or oh, thank um, you and plug and plug all your uh, your social media and all of that. I'm going to link your website in the description to this video. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I, you know, I had like six or seven uh, in-person events, workshops around the world that now couldn't happen. So I've moved it all online and it's an eight week boot camp for string players, but primarily for bowed string players who want to learn improvisation and go beyond their classical background and, you know, delve into musicianship. And that's starting this Saturday. Um, I always have, I'm always open to give private lessons through my uh, creative strings Academy, which I've had for 15 years, which is basically my online private studio. Uh, so people can get a membership and access all my curriculum and then they can get feedback from me. But um, I also do uh, bu music business coaching. So I've got different different ways that you can take advantage of music business coaching for me. If you want clients, if you want to make money, if you want to learn how to sell yourself more effectively, learn the business side, you know, reach out to me and I'll help you with that. And I would say just check, subscribe to my YouTube channel if somebody's watching because I put out a video every single day and I do these play along lessons, which actually, Sean, I'd be really interested to see what you thought about this because I think you would be great at doing this and I think the format is really cool and nobody's doing it. So what I'll do is I'll like, I have my violin and there I'll set up a loop behind me and I did like I did like lean on me the other day but I also do like jazz and I did like a hip hop one and so I'll be like okay play after me you play it and I'll do like five six minute lessons like this and I'll do them for like age 9 to 12 12 to 15 15 to 18 and 18 to advance on the same song so I've that's done a great like idea man bluegrass doo-wop like feel good pop with southern soul hip-hop uh gypsy jazz bebop like and so that's that's the stuff I'm putting out and people love you would be great at that man so, so and someone just told me yesterday like I'm a piano player and I love your play along videos so it could be so if you play an instrument out there and you want a, a different way to learn these bite-sized five-minute lessons subscribe to my channel I put out one every day that's that's uh that's really great man thanks so much for your time and your energy man you I always feel inspired after uh after we talk man I always right. feel inspired and I and I and I feel like okay uh, yeah, I, it always confirms some things that have sort of been nagging me. It's <laughs> like, ah, uh, this guy just said this out loud. I got to actually get <laughs> out here and do this. No, but hey, man, just to be clear, though, man, you are the king, man. In my book, man, I got so much respect. I mean, like the list of things that you do incredibly well is so humbling to me man so please i would uh, you know it's i mean it's we all have to make choices about whatever we're going to focus on but i mean you got my unending forever respect and friendship man i appreciate you very much i appreciate you too and uh you know i pray for your family and and i pray for you know our community and and i pray that we get out of this thing as soon as possible uh thanks again chris thank you sean